All right, welcome back for the last part of One Man's Faith today. We're looking at what I call the big easy. And we're, we're looking at Isaiah 55. We're talking about David. Now, we've got to understand, David was no different than you and I. He started out as a young boy. We, we pick him up in, uh, in uh, 1 Samuel. Uh, he, he is a shepherd boy. It's very possible he wasn't even wanted that much by his father. Because Jesse had seven sons. Six were with him in the house. But David was out in the field watching the flock. As a matter of fact, Samuel comes to him and says, hey, one of your kids is going to be anointed king. You know, start to bring him out to me. He's, and he brought the oldest one. And Samuel looked at him and God said, no. And he said, you got another one? Six times. No, 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 no. And Samuel said, is that it? And Jesse said, well, there is one more. He's out in the field watching the sheep. And Samuel said, well, I'm not leaving until you bring him to me. And he was the one. It's, a, it's possible that David was if I can use the term a bastard child, uh, not of the same uh, mother as the other six. He was considered ruddy, which means he was red. Uh, one of the Psalms talks about, um, I, was, I, was, I, I was born in iniquity. It was, it was the Psalm of David. It says, I think, it's, I think it's 51, I was born in iniquity. So he was, he, he was kind of forgotten. He was, he was out in the field. He was out in the field, but he's the one God chose at 14 or 15. He has to wait 21 years or maybe 25, I've forgotten which, until Saul died before he would take um, command as king. And yet, what seems to be a Mr. Goody Two-Shoes, because he's the one that also said, hey, anybody that comes against my God and says Israel, Israel is no good is going down. And that was with Goliath, okay? He does all this stuff. David slain his ten thousands while Saul slain a thousand. All this stuff. But yet, let me tell you, he's also the man that fell in love with a woman that was married, got her pregnant, and then kills her husband. You know, for, you know, many of us haven't even gone that far. And we think we're no good to God. And yet, this was a man that God said is after my own heart. This is a man who even later in his life sinned by taking a census of the people, something he wasn't supposed to do unless God told him to. God says, you will not count the people because he didn't want the king relying on the number of people he has rather than on God. But somehow, in the, and the word says that, that our adversary uh, deceived David in taking the sentence and, and, and it, brought, uh, it brought a punishment on, on the people. Uh, or on David, and since David was king, it fell to the people. He was just like you and me, and yet God said, this is a man after my own heart. This God also says that I, in the end times, will rebuild the tabernacle of David. Because David understood God. And David, um, as you know, we, there was a tabernacle, and we talked about that a little while ago. There was a tabernacle of Moses, which God gave and downloaded into Moses all the plans for it. And it stayed with the people until um, after they took, took, the, um, took all the promised land. And uh, the Ark of the Covenant somehow got taken by the Philistines, returned back, and stayed uh, in... Uh, in, I think Shiloh, I forgot exactly, I'd have to go look. Um, 
until David decided, hey, God needs a house. And so he brought it into Jerusalem and he set up a tabernacle until he was able to build the temple. He set up a tabernacle, he put the Ark of the Covenant in there, and then he said, okay, priests, 24-7 music in front of this, and in this temple, in this tabernacle. And this is the tabernacle that God says, I'm going to rebuild David's tabernacle. Not Moses's, David's, in the end. And this is the man that God says, I am going to make an everlasting covenant with you as I did with David. According to the faithful mercies. You see, God had mercy on David. He has the same mercy on you. None of us are higher in position and stature when it comes to God. He says, I am not a respecter of persons. Come to me. That means every one of us, you, yes, you, can come to God. But you don't know what I've done. It doesn't matter. What we got to learn to do, this is part of the big easy. Repent. Come to God and say, God, forgive me. Now, you got to mean it. You've got to want to be with God. But you say, God, oh, forgive me. Forgive me, Lord, I, God, I accept you as Lord of my life. I want to walk with you. Be Lord over me. Show me how to walk. Help me to listen to you, God, that I can follow your ways. And God, I believe you raised Jesus from the dead and I make him Lord of my life. That's the starting point. And from there, you have full access to God. Okay. He says, come, come to me, and I will give you rest. Now, Rest equals peace. I will give you peace. You will be so rested, you won't worry about a thing. In Exodus 23, it says, But on the seventh year you shall let it rest. Let it rest. What does that mean? He's talking about the land. You shall let it rest. In other words, every seven years, Israel was to not till do anything to the land for a whole year. That's rest. God says, I will give you rest. See, it's, it's not a matter of work. Rest is the opposite of work. It's the opposite of work. It's not doing anything. It's sitting back. Uh, Exodus 34 says, you shall work six days, but on the seventh day you shall rest. Even during plowing time and harvest, you shall rest. You know, so often we get so busy, we run out of time, and so we want to do it on Sunday, and it's wrong. God says, you rest. Now, if your day of rest is, is, is Friday, Shabbat, or Saturday, that's fine. But don't do any work. And that's what rest is. It's the opposite of work. How do we not rest? The, there is that point. Hebrews 4, let me give it to you. Therefore, let us fear while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. Verse 11, therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. No rest is a sign of disobedience. All right. No rest is equal to disobedience. If we don't learn to rest in God, and that's just, that's not a Sabbath, just a Sabbath thing. He says, come to me and I will give you rest. Okay? It's that easy. We come to him and we don't have to worry. 
about anything. He says, listen, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. I wish I had more time. But yoke is kind of a sign of burden, of work. But he says, my yoke is easy. The yoke is there to make the two animals work together. Jesus has a yoke. He says, my yoke is easy. The word easy there means comfortable and pleasant. You look, if you look at that, my yoke is easy. That word easy means comfortable and pleasant. Learn to come to him. Get here, hear him through his word and then rest. Rest is also indicative of faith. Learn to walk in faith. You don't have to worry. Matthew 6, says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. In other words, come to the Lord, and He will give you rest. He will pull with you. As a matter of fact, He'll do most of the pulling when it comes to anything that enters into your life that is not rest. Finances, they're His. Learn what the Word says. I didn't get to this, but, but maybe, what, maybe I'll go ahead and do it next week because I want us to understand as we start into this new year that we don't have to work. We have to rest. We have to learn to come to Him because His yoke is easy and His burden is light. Father, I thank You. I thank You, Lord. May we be open enough to hear You. Lord, teach us to work with You, to walk with You, to be Your people. Lord, I pray You would go out and touch lives and bring them to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Have a great time. I'll see you next time.